Hi, I'm Jason Bradford. I'm Rob Dietz. And I'm Asher Miller. Welcome to Crazy Town, where residents are feeling nostalgic about 1950s era fallout shelters. The topic of today's episode is net energy. And please stay tuned for an insightful interview with Alice Friedman. Hey, Asher, Jason, welcome to another fine episode of Crazy Town. I would like one of you to volunteer to answer a question. Who's it going to be? You want to Rochambeau for that? Sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, you beat me. Yeah. Okay, Asher, you're on the hot spot here, or hot seat here. I don't know what a, being on a hot spot is. Anyway, uh, here it is. What do you eat in a day? What is your, what's it like, just give me like a typical day all the food that you put in your body. Okay, first thing is coffee. Okay, coffee yeah, me with too. Coconut yeah, okay. milk. Ooh. Okay, okay, that's, that's nice. where I start. Uh, then I will have mushrooms and spinach. What? For and breakfast? yeah, okay. and a little bit of uh, of sausage meat uh-huh. with it. Wow, that sounds pretty tasty. I, it's, I, it's good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and then for lunch, I might have a soup, like a vegetable soup, something like that. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and then for dinner, God, it depends on what my amazing wife makes. Mm. But How lucky. Yeah, usually vegetables, a salad. I, I've eaten at your house. It's quite good, the dinner. You'll have a, a really nice uh, salad. But and, it's a normal, it's a normal size plate, you know, with like, I don't know, a pound of food on it or something like that total. Yeah. And then, you know, and then after all that, I, I, I take it like a huge shot of meth or uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. is that is that called uh that, that is not food that? i don't That's think food? Yeah. okay, okay. The, the reason i ask you is i wanted to compare what a normal sized person <laughs> i'm so doing, glad to hear doing, i'm a normal sized uh, person doing normal yeah. activities like podcasting what what <laughs> what you take in versus what half thor bjornson takes in you guys know who half thor is his name really is name? half thor half thor yeah he's the he's the mountain from iceland uh, he literally played the mountain in the in the tv show game of thrones oh i, I remember okay. that character. huge guy he's yeah. he's, six he's foot only foot half nine. half thor yeah, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. imagine if he was a full thor right he'd be 12 <laughs> right. foot uh, 18 right. or whatever. yeah He's six foot nine, four hundred and twenty-five pounds. Holy shit! Okay? That's big. So this guy, he's a strong man, right? That's what he yeah. he was. At least he was. He was doing this for a living. He was lifting heavy objects. Basically, I, I love those shows. Like, why don't you pull this airplane? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. with your teeth. I mean, the exactly. crazy thing is, he's actually been training. Uh, in September, later this year, September of 2021, he's going to be in a fight with another strongman, Eddie Hall. They've they've signed a contract to like be in a, a, fight a fight. boxing match. Nice. Oh, my God. So they're like actually slimming down. He probably only weighs 400 pounds now. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, let me, get, let me run through. When he's doing strongman training, I'm going to read you what Half Thor eats in one day. Okay. 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 And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do this like one of those drug commercials where they list the side right. effects. Okay. Like super kind fast. Of fast. Or we'll be here all Well, day. Melody, yeah. Melody, can you just speed this up? Yeah, for yeah us? make that's, this one that's and not a half bad X. idea. Okay, he starts off with some protein powder, some glutamine, and a handful of almonds. Then he goes to eight eggs, 200 grams of oats, blueberries and strawberries, avocado, 400 grams of beef, 400 grams of sweet potatoes, handful of spinach and greens. More amino acids and glutamine, 400 grams of chicken, 400 grams potatoes, greens, plus some fruits, 150 grams of oats or sweet potatoes, two bananas, 150 grams of Kellogg's Rice Krispies, frozen berries, handful of almonds, peanut butter, glutamine. Okay, here we go. More. Glutamine, Vitargo, 60 grams of protein, two bananas, 500 grams of beef, 500 grams of potatoes, greens, 500 grams of salmon, 500 grams of sweet potatoes, 50 grams of casein protein or six eggs, avocado, 30 grams of almonds, 50 grams of peanut butter, 50 grams of casein protein or raw eggs. Done. 13 wow. pounds. Yeah, because whenever you said like Holy 400 shit. grams or 500 grams, that's about a pound. It's un- And he had a lot of things where it's like 400 grams of fish. How does he afford 500 this? 500 grams of chicken. Well, I mean, I think he's... he's a strong man. Yeah, he's, he's world-renowned. I mean, he I makes mean, a lot of money, I think. But... That is a crazy amount of food. I mean, it enables him to do some amazing stuff. Like he broke, I think last year, the, the world record for the deadlift. The, the man lifted 
1,104 pounds off of the ground. That's pretty good. That's good. The three of us, we, we make like one half Thor, and we still couldn't lift that much. We make, yeah, we'd have we, we make a quarter Thor. Yeah. Right, right. This actually reminds me, I, I actually don't, I'm not that impressed. Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> Here's why. Because, Rob, you and I both read recently, actually, we read this, uh, this book about the Lewis and and Clark expedition, right? Right, yeah. right. Those guys were eating 10 pounds of meat a right. day. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? And they're not six foot nine, 400 and something pounds. Yeah. I don't know. I'm still impressed, okay? Okay, uh, I'm impressed too, but... I'm out of breath just reading his list. Imagine if yeah. I had to do the training he was doing. I mean, that's over a week of food for me. I mean, Thank I, God he's mixing it up a little bit. He's not just <laughs> literally eating meat, right. you know, the whole time. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, when you're wandering out in the wilderness and you don't know much about which plants you can eat, uh, I guess that's the safety food. Right? Well, I think they're burning so many calories. Yeah. Just, yeah. You know, well, I think, that's a, I think this, you know, they bring this up because of energy and our show today is about the hidden driver is net energy. So similar to society, Half Thor has a diet and the surplus he can get out of that diet allows him... To do an amazing amount of work. It's incredible. Lifting a thousand pound bar. Or yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's right. I mean, if you think about uh, if he just had to survive, I mean, he's a huge person anyway. He'd yeah. still be having to eat a lot. Yes. But maybe he'd eat three or four pounds a day instead right. of the 13 yeah. because he's got to put all this extra muscle on and do all these uh, high calorie activities. Yeah. Right? I read I, I read some time ago, like, you know, if Flash, the, the superhero Flash. Yeah. The speedster. The speedster. Like someone has said, if he was actually going 700 miles an hour, like, you know, and he ran this far, it's using this many calories. He'd have to eat. And it was like, you know, it was like a Thor diet or more, right? You know, not a half Thor diet, a Thor diet. So it always bothers me that superheroes don't seem to eat a whole lot because they're using a lot of energy. Well, he's so fast, he just eats and you can't see it. (laughs) Right. Yeah. We are really geeky. Can I just say, because last night I was having a conversation around the, the dinner table with my family. It's my, my son's birthday. And I don't know, for some reason, my, my younger son brought up the idea of like, what if you like made a baby in, in just like 15 minutes instead of nine months? Right. Yeah. And we were talking about how many calories right, you would need. Kirsten had to consume over a nine-month period. Like, basically right. the same as half Thor in a day. Yeah. More, <laughs> yeah. 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 more than that. Yeah. I think it was something like, you know, 30,000 calories. Or, right. No, 300,000 calories. Right. So how, she couldn't even possibly eat all that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that's what's interesting. So it, there's sort of an analogy here that we kind of take for granted that Thor can just get all this food and do these great things. Or half Thor, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> but our society is kind of the same way. You know, this exorbitant, the exorbitant energy we have, or specifically we want to talk about net energy, has been available to society since the discovery and exploitation of fossil fuels, we tend to be kind of blind to that. And so we want to basically talk specifically about net energy and how it created this modern world we've got. Can we just start by defining it for folks? Now Please, we've, you're good at this. Well, <laughs> give me that compliment after I've tried to right, do this. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's, let's not be too hasty in dishing out the awards here. <laughs> I mean, the, he, didn't, uh, he didn't deadlift a thousand pounds. No, no, he didn't. He just ate like a couple pounds. Not even. Uh, so the, the first thing I would say is we've, we've spoken about energy quite a bit on this podcast. It's a major focus, obviously, for Post Carbon Institute. We're, we're talking about hidden drivers in this season of the podcast, but we see energy as the kind of the key driver of the world that we inhabit now. So we've, we've talked a little bit about net energy before. And people might want to check out some of the early episodes we did, like in season one, for example. But just to to rehash and redefine a little bit, I think we have to dis- differentiate net energy from gross energy, right? Yeah. So gross energy is all the energy that is basically being produced or consumed in a situation. Yeah, it's like right? when you read a stat, like the U.S. consumes X amount of energy in a year or your household used X amount of right. energy and you pay your, your bill. That's the, that's the gross energy, right? But the net energy is actually the, the energy that's left over after you expended energy to get it in the first place. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So if you're out there hunting to get calories, you're spending some energy to get the calories 
that you end up getting from hunting. So I think a good it's analogy, the difference. Yeah, actually with like, hey, I made a million dollars last year. And then it's like, well, how much did you spend? 1.2 million, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so it, 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 what's impressive is actually the, not the gross, but the net. Right? I, I think it was impressive that you spent $1.2 million <laughs> and earned $1 million. That's, right, uh, right. That's, we should stop this podcast and get you working on a, a different I, kind of a show. I lost weight. I lost weight in the process. <laughs> um, so in, in our world, there's, there's a concept that, that's gone around that is basically energy return on investment which was uh, coined by a guy named Charles Hall. Sometimes it's called energy return on energy invested. So E-R-O-I or E-R-O-E-I. And that's or kind of... Or E-I-E-I-O. Exactly. <laughs> it's kind of a take on the, the sort of the idea of ROI, which is a, a very common concept in, in like business, right? Mm-hmm. A return on investment. So this is the energy return on the investment. That's the same thing as net energy, basically. Yeah. And it's kind of, it, I've written about this before. It makes such great sense as a stat. Like if you're going to say bring in oil and use it in the economy, like first you got to go out and get it and that takes energy. Right. So it's a, it's a question of subtracting what's left over after you, after you've but gone he, out looking. Here's the key thing. We don't track it. Right. We don't understand it. We don't think about it. We don't talk about it. All we talk about is the gross energy numbers. Net energy is not something that's factored into any decision making. It's not something you can easily find anywhere. And that's why it's a hidden driver. Well, right. and I think it's a, maybe you, you kind of weren't meaning to do this, Jason, but I think it it's probably comes down to money. You know, like oh, we, it, we it track hidden. everything in dollars. Right. We don't track things in energy. Yeah. Right. Well, I think it's easy, though, to understand it. If you give like real life examples, so the the three of us, I, I just want to let you know that we're going on a on a, on a hunting expedition after oh, the show. Wait, we are can't yeah. wait. Yeah. So anyway, we're going to meet under the oak tree over here, and uh, I got some spears lined up, um, <laughs> and uh, we're going to basically we have to bring home dinner. Can I bring? You home for looks, dinner? No, like, no we like have to. We're, uh, that make eating, it a lot easier. No, we're eating spears for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, just just imagine though the difference. Let's say let's say we get we we do really good job. Either we're skillful or we're lucky, and we go out and in ten minutes we've we speared um, we speared a mastodon. And what, what kind of farm is this you're living on? <laughs> and we're just welcome like, to Jurassic Farm. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like one of those big game hunting places where you feel yeah. like you're like this hero, but they've actually just populated it with, right, with right. animals for you to shoot. Yeah, oh, it's like Dick Cheney's famous uh, right. hunting session. <laughs> yeah, none where of they that. Let none the bird that. out. Please of the don't cage. shoot me in the face. <laughs> yeah. Just have spears. It's a spear in the face. Yeah, don't it's... don't spear me in the face. But you know, if you if we come back with a giant quarry after ten minutes. It's party on. Like, our families are going to be so happy. You know, it's going to be just fun times. We'll have, we'll have days, weeks of leisure because we've gotten enough return on that, on that investment of going out and hunting. The net energy we've come back with is enormous. By contrast, what if we were to go out and we're gone for like a week and we come back with two squirrels and a <laughs> guinea pig? You know, that would suck, right? <laughs> and it really wouldn't have been worth it. And no one's going to be happy with us. And we're going to have lost weight. And so I think that's, that's important for us to understand. If you come back quickly with a high reward hunting expedition, you're freed up to just sort of party for a while. And if you don't, it's stressful. Yeah. And, and if you're not successful, time. you could die. I mean, yeah. this happens in, in nature, right? Yes. I, I have to go back to the book Born to Run. Mm. I, I know you think it's just a Bruce Springsteen yes. song, mm. Jason. Oh. But, uh, I, I but, won't burst out in the song. Okay, this time. I was cool. I was just I, trying I'm to tempt so you. You I'm, started. But, I'm pulling back. Uh, but no, I, it's a book by Christopher McDougall, and it's about persistence hunting, oh, like yeah. how humans used to run down prey like antelope out on the savanna they yeah. take like days chasing an animal till it burned out and had a heart attack like yeah. how does that return any calories yeah and it's because we can sweat is a big deal yeah yeah if it were the three of us on a persistence hunt for the guinea pig and two squirrels we, we'd probably be a, a, a squirrel would be dragging your body back a share one would have you Jason a guinea pig I'd make it like a hundred yards it. and I'd be bending over breathing heavily like, yeah you guys go on there'd be a guinea pig population explosion right, right. Uh, well so okay I think I have a pretty good understanding of of what we mean by net energy and hopefully our, our listeners do too but I want to turn to what are the implications then like if 
if we're able to achieve high net energy, what is it that, uh, that that does for us in society? Can we just do a quick historical take on this for a second? Yeah. We've, we've spoken about this before, but I think it's, it's important to point out. We wouldn't exist without net energy, right? No, no organism would exist without net energy. And when we were in hunter-gatherer tribes, we were able to sort of figure that out. And in some cases, you could say that they were more successful in, in achieving net energy in, in terms of how they foraged and did the things that they did. But a big thing that happened for us, and we talked about this, was in the complexity uh, and specialization one, where once we figured out agriculture, we were able to be sedentary. We were able to get a they lot. Store of, the surplus. Yeah, we we were able to get a surplus and store it, and then we that created complexity in society and all these other things. And so that's something that we we've been able to achieve as a species, you know, for for millennia. But something really dramatically different happened when we found fossil fuels because it's kind of like we talked about this before too. It's sort of winning the energy lottery, yeah. you know. They've calculated that some agrarian societies, they they sort of operate on a 10 to 1 yeah, or so about right. ratio, right? So that was their, the, they for every one calorie of energy that they had to expend on creating energy, food. mostly in the case of food, wood. they would get 10 calories back, right? right. So that's a 10 to 1 ratio. When we found out how to harness fossil fuels with technology, particularly if you look at oil, we're talking about just a magnitude difference, you yeah. know, early oil, like the, the Beverly hillbillies thing, you mm-hmm. know, where you hit a hole in the ground and it gushes out. We're talking hundreds to one ratio, yeah. you know? So just as by way of context, yeah. what a windfall yeah. and, and very, unprecedented in, in, in nature. Yeah. yeah. Very little energy expended and suddenly huge energy return on that that original energy investment. And the, and the key is understand that that's all ancient sunlight. So the energy came from the past and it got fossilized, right? And, and it and took eons. Millions, yeah, millions of years. Yeah. And so the, the thing is, is then, and then it's mostly underground. So you're not competing for above ground sort of space or, you know, the, there's very little trade-off you have to make. Whereas in agriculture or forestry, it's like you've got to harvest stuff in your environment, in your immediate environment. And so it, it, you can't do other things with that space as much. Whereas yeah. with fossil fuels, you're tapping these underground reservoirs and you can still like build around them and farm around them. So uh, there's less trade-offs in terms of spatial relationships too. Well, and look at, look at what we've done since unleashing this, uh, this treasure trove of fuel. I mean, we've built up these societies that are marked by the kind of infrastructure that we're now familiar with, right? Like we've got roads and and electronic uh, equipment everywhere, and we've got vehicles, and we've got manufacturing, and we've got giant cargo ships that that are transporting goods all around the world. And at the same time, we figured out, like you were talking about a share, the original sort of 10 to 1 in the food sector Well, now we don't really think that way anymore. We don't have to because we've got these huge tractors that can go out and till up uh, unbelievable amounts of soil. And then we throw in petrochemicals to to help grow our corn and soybeans. And we are uh, just mechanizing everything we can because of this huge surplus of energy that we've got. And the irony, of course, is that whereas maybe the food system used to be 10 to 1 profit, now it's the reverse. And the only reason that you can have a food system that is negative... Meaning for every one calorie of food that we get, we actually have to put in 10 calories. Yeah, and it depends on where you draw the boundary. Like at the farm gate level, it's it's closer to one to one. It's, you know, maybe we we put in one and a half and get one. But as you, as you go into processing and all that, and we've had a whole episode on this as well, and you get towards like, you know, getting it to your refrigerator, right. that's when you start getting where it's one calorie is returned for every 10 you invest. <laughs> where, and so it's, it's, a, it's a flip. Now, the only reason you can run a food system like that is because there's another system, the energy system, where you're making these huge windfall profits of energy return on investment or net energy. Right. And when you say the 10 calories in, that's not human calories, that's no. burning calories. It's, it's hydrocarbon calories. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so all these all these energy sort of metrics are interchangeable, watts and joules and calories, right? I think how fast we can go through 10 calories of hydrocarbons. Woohoo! You know, you just turn on the the vehicle for about a minute and you're, yeah. you're just 
burning it all away. So what we've talked about is by mechanizing these primary industries like forestry and agriculture, uh, mining, and getting these windfall returns, we are able then to have up people you know not not need to be laboring in those industries so you can create labor in other industries so i think we're done with our podcast happy happy ending good story <laughs> yeah. right yeah uh, pat ourselves on the back we won the lottery we're uh, it's excuse all me sir uh, excuse me i'm not sure the story's complete yet <laughs> right so obviously there's lots of downsides to this you know i don't think we're going to spend time talking about the environmental downsides or the human cost downsides or any of that stuff but but of course, there's a, uh, a shoot a drop, and that is that we're dealing with declining net energy, and we're dealing with it in in the the fossil fuel energy system as well. So, if you think about it, our colleague Richard Heinberg often talks about it as we pick the low hanging fruit first, right? So, the cheap and easy stuff to get was the stuff that we went after first, and uh, that had the biggest re- energy return on energy invested, had the biggest probably financial return as well on on financial investment, and uh, and when you pick the low hanging fruit, at a certain point you're going to run out of that stuff, and then you got to go for the harder and harder things. And and here we are in a situation where, and I may have talked about this before on the podcast, but ten something years ago, was it ten years ago? God, the Deepwater Horizon explosion that yeah. happened in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, it's this deep water ocean rig, and there was an explosion, you know, thousands of feet down in in the Gulf of Mexico, and it was basically just pouring out all of this pollution. Nobody talked about, at that time, why are we even drilling thousands of feet down in deep water in yeah. the first place. Yeah, think of yeah. the engineering complexity of, it was like 5,000 feet of water plus another right. 5,000 feet of ocean bed or something like that. Right, right, and yeah. It was like a 10,000 like, foot holy drill. Holy shit. Incredible. What a What an engineering marvel. You, but like, yeah, that's a lot harder than uh, than Jed shooting at his squirrel and right. hitting a gusher in the and, backyard. Th- and think about it. I mean, you got tar sands, you know, like uh, in, up in Canada where that's not even... Oil that's finished cooking, right. you know, and being being prepared. We have to like pour water and natural gas into it to like finish it up, you know. And we've got fracking where we're drilling down thousands of feet and then going miles laterally, horizontally, exploding rock. We're going after the source, you know, right. uh, source rock oil there and gas. We wouldn't be doing that if we weren't faced with a situation where the cheap and easy stuff was was harder and harder to get to. Yeah. Yeah. What are some estimates of current like current projects net energy that you've seen? Well, I think one so one thing that's important I think to to reference are some caveats here, yeah. right? So one of the challenges with talking about net energy is where you draw the boundaries. Yes. You know, people have different because we don't we have not prioritized this as no a society. Yeah. Yeah. There isn't a standard. It's not a field of study. It's not, you know, people are not collecting information and data on this the way that we collect on a bunch of other things. And so people's definition of where they set the boundary varies. Yeah. So like you could have two different researchers saying, okay, yeah. what's the energy return on energy invested for a rooftop solar array? And they would come up with maybe two different numbers because one of them includes the aluminum for the... Uh, the the frame that the panels sit on, the other one doesn't, or, or the transmission lines and the whole system that right. is you know supported by you know other forms of energy. Yeah, that that kind of overhead cost, yeah. it's included or not, different right. levels. It's, so yeah, putting that caveat aside, as I said earlier, earlier, you know, the the early days of oil, we're dealing with with fields that were we're netting you know hundred to one, Plus, many cases yeah. more than that. Now we're in a situation where probably at the extreme other end, you've got tar sands, depending upon the, the way that they do the tar sands, you've got a five to one or a three to one ratio. It's similar yeah. to then the agrarian society. Less than in <laughs> yeah, some or ways, less, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's the thing. I think it's important. It's, like you're saying, it's very hard to know what the exact numbers are because it's, it's hard to compare apples to apples. But the trend is so obvious, and it's and it's obvious at this sort of order of magnitude difference between what the net energy we had to build the modern society versus the net energy of the current energy sources and and technologies that we're now 
relying on for the future. And so there's a mix right now. where We have this legacy of some of this conventional oil, which is still giving us tremendous returns. And then we're adding on to that these other sources that are that are not so not so great. The downside of those is a bit hidden because we're not fully reliant on them yet. Well, yeah. And here's where I want to take this. I, I'm I'm not done talking about Half Thor Bjornsson oh, yet because uh, yeah. because the guy's like a comic book character <laughs> or something. But I think the implication, you know, you say net energy is declining. Well, that's really scary because. Think about it from the perspective of the half Thor diet, right? Like if, (laughs) let's say we turn that into the quarter Thor diet, right? Or even the 10th Thor diet where he just doesn't have anywhere near as many calories to spend on on his bodybuilding and his strongman competition. Like like, like we say, today he gets a Mastodon like leg, but then tomorrow he gets two guinea pigs. Right, yeah. Yeah, the big difference. That's a big difference. Right, so you can easily uh, you know imagine what's going to happen to him he's he, his muscles are going to shrink he's not going to be able to deadlift a thousand whatever pounds he just won't be able to perform the same degree of feats that that he had become accustomed to and i think you would basically see the same thing happening in society as our surplus level of energy our leftover or net energy uh, is getting less and less we cannot do the same things that we've been doing. Right. We can't deadlift as much. Right. That uh, sucks. <laughs> anyway, I think though, you know, so there are a lot of people, actually relatively not that many, but there are a it's number like 12. Of, we yeah, there's a dozen right people <laughs> who have been contemplating this issue for like years to decades, honestly. And sort of, it's sort of like the hidden concern, I would say, for uh, that this issue is brought up because it's such such giant implications for what society looks like in the future. This is good. Society has enough net energy to study the net energy problem. Correct. What you're saying. For now. <laughs> <laughs> and so with, I, I, I kind of um, was thinking about ways people have gotten at this question. What happens to society in declining in a declining net energy state where we end up going from, you know, say a, a 30 to 1 maybe today back down to a 10 to 1 or 5 to 1? And the, the term is used as the net energy cliff. There's actually, there's just maybe thresholds where it gets very hard to maintain modern infrastructure and civilization if, you, if net energy gets too low. I, yeah, various ways I, of looking at this. I think it's interesting to, to dis- differentiate or distinguish between societies that have maintained a relatively low net energy. Uh, like the demand. Yeah. The, yeah. So if you look at traditionally agrarian societies, you look at hunter-gatherer tribes, even the Amish or some other right. you know, communities that have maintained relatively low. I don't know that anyone studied the net energy profile of the, of the Amish or, or anything, but... There's a really good book called Power Down. I, he didn't put the numbers in, but it was a graduate student who went to live, I think, in a Mennonite community. And it was about, yeah, just uh, how is life when you're powering right. down your existence? No, it's it. called Better Off. Was it? Yes. Oh, that's right. Richard's book was Power yeah. Down. I've Better read off. way too many of these this things. This guy was an a- MIT graduate student, actually. And he, he, it was funny. He went and lived with basically this Anabaptist community. Hmm. So, but, but yeah, I think but, you're right. That's a good example. Like, we can look today at some of some, even within the U.S., there are sort of these subcultures which are living with lower net energy. But I think the key thing here, that's what I want to differentiate, between those who have maintained a certain way of being mm-hmm. And societies like ours who went fucking batshit crazy right. for a long time, right. right? And how they adjust to having less net energy. And I'm trying to think about, you know, examples of this. It's not a total one, you know, uh, perfect comparison point. But if you think about Cuba yeah. as an example and, and what they went through and what, what's called their special period, which was that, you know, Cuba was heavily dependent upon the Soviet Union for imports of all kinds of things, including yeah. fuel. Yep. And uh, like many island nations, you know, were heavily dependent on imports of all kinds. And they exported sugar cane to like the Soviet bloc, and then they got a lot of calorie crops like wheat and, and right. return, these kind of things. So you're telling me that cigars were not the main export of Cuba? Uh, a big one, you know, <laughs> but not everything. So, <laughs> but then the Soviet Union collapsed, and, and suddenly Cuba was faced in a situation where they could not get these imports, mm-hmm. you know. And so they went through this very difficult, challenging period. 
where I think the average Cuban lost like 15 pounds. They were not, yeah. I'm assuming, quite that they weren't like, you know, a beast to begin with right. as a population, right? right? So 15 pounds. No, I think most Cubans at that time looked like half Thor Bjornsson. <laughs> right. yeah. They were 425 pounds. They lost 15. I, I just point this out because, you know, many, many Americans, many listeners be like, yeah, we could all yeah. lose 50 <laughs> yeah. pounds, no right. big deal. Yeah. But it was very challenging time. The way that they dealt with it was fascinating. In fact, there's a film that was made about it um, years ago, and people can find it online called The Power of Community. I think it's on YouTube now. And they they were fortunate in the sense that they had some advanced planning and preparation for mm-hmm. a possibility of this. And they had some university programs that were doing small-scale organic agriculture. Right. And they were able to get those folks to train the population very quickly to basically start growing a ton of food everywhere in yeah. the urban cities, you know, they broke rural. up the big old consolidated farms and they broke up the smaller units and right. got people out to the countryside. They, they started, they took like, like train cars and they put them on the back of, of trucks, mm. you know what I mean? And that was their, their mass transit that they had. Yeah. So they, they figured out how to adjust and to get around with, with using much less energy and they had to do it in a very sudden, yeah, you know, sudden circumstance. And I think they're not, I mean, the Soviet union, like the, the Russia, you know, itself, when it collapsed, there was this, there was sort of the notion of uh, the, the population had these dotches. So like the, a lot of, a lot of people that live in Moscow, for example, in these apartment buildings mm-hmm. for the summer, they would go out to these little country shacks and they would grow food. Yeah. So uh, again, there was sort of, they had a way of, of getting by by tying themselves back to the land. Yeah. I want to do a really quick callback to that book, Better Off, because I feel yeah. bad about getting it wrong. That, yeah. was, that was written by Eric Brend. Yes. And it's called Better Off, Flipping the Switch on Technology. Yeah, it, great book. It, it was, yeah, it was a good one. Um, I also think if you believe uh, historical narratives, you know, you can – try to look into the past before we had such th- this influx of, of fossil fuels and yeah. this huge jump in net energy. I remember in, uh, in 1980, I, uh, oh, that's way we, back. Yeah. Then. We packed up the family car. So this is yeah <laughs> with fossil fuels. And we drove, uh, from Atlanta up to the DC area. And on the way we stopped at colonial Williamsburg. You guys ever been to that place? No, I have not. It's uh, like I can't, a working farm from the period of. Like well, I can't call it an amusement park. No, it's more like a working village. Yeah, uh, right, they, they have people like like actors. Yeah, reenactors. Yeah, yeah, yeah they dressed like, up and playing roles like churning butter and shit. Yeah, we like got to awesome. go into the gingerbread shop and and buy <laughs> from you know where they had the big wood fired stove or oven and yeah, it was great. Ginger is a tropical. Yeah, uh, do you think colonial? <laughs> well, it was it was molasses. Really, okay, you know? okay. They right. just still called it a ginger, so that so yeah. that us modern people would know what the hell we were buying. Yeah, molasses cookies. Or something. <laughs> right. I don't know if they're still doing that in Williamsburg. Probably. But. Okay. <laughs> it's, it was pretty cool, though. I mean, they have the original buildings, and the layout right. of the town is neat. But yeah, but you know, you, you can start to see uh, how the reenactors live. Of course, they probably just go to their trailer park after the day is done, sucking down Coors beers and watching Netflix or whatever. <laughs> no, we're not even talking about sort of a dark side of of societies that had less net energy in terms of how they exploited labor, particularly slave labor. Mm-hmm. Right? Of course, that made yeah. me think of that. That's not something we want to go to, obviously. Yeah. Right. But I bet a, a lot of our listeners, and certainly the, the broader public, might be asking, like, what are you guys talking about? We got renewable energy. We know we got to get away from fossil fuels. You guys are just talking about fossil fuels here. What's the issue here? Because we have these renewable alternatives, right? Yeah. So I think we got to talk about that in mm-hmm. this context and, t- and talk about the role of technology a little bit. Yeah, I think that's really important because, uh, you know, but I think a lot of what you would think about renewables is another term I've heard from them is rebuildables in that, you know, they, that infrastructure that you build, if you build a bunch of solar panels or you build wind, tur- wind turbines, it, those eventually wear out. Things break down. Entropy is a real problem. And some of the first generation wind turbines right now are being taken apart and put into landfills because... They wore, they wore out and they're getting replaced maybe. But what's happening now is if you think of all the components, all the, all the metal components for these things and concrete and 
all that stuff is actually getting harder to get. There's actually a there's actually more energy required now to go mine copper than there ever was, right? Those ore, the ore concentration. It's like right. the low-hanging fruit principle applies not just to us trying to access energy, but also to access all these other materials that go into the industrial economy. Yeah, you try to imagine a, uh, a mining machine that's powered by a, what, like a wind turbine that's stuck on top of it or <laughs> some, some solar panel. Like you, you can't rebuild a, an infrastructure right now, a, right. a renewable energy infrastructure, using renewable energy as the source. Well, I think so there's two things here. There's the fact that renewable energy right now is still heavily dependent upon fossil fuels. And there are major challenges to substitution of fossil fuels with renewable energy. We've, we've talked about this before. Listeners can go check out. Uh, we published a book, which was really an analysis of the renewable energy transition called Our Renewable Future. And you can go to ourrenewablefuture.org to get all this information. In fact, we even have a section on there if you go to the present section and where we talk about sort of the life cycle uh, an analysis of different things in in you know in the average American's life uh, to un- unpack some of that stuff. But just from the standpoint of thinking about the net energy of renewables, again, it's difficult to come up with a, an exact number of, on these things. But I, I think it is fair and even conservative to say the return mm-hmm. does not match the returns that we had gotten when we built the modern world the yeah. way we built it. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it just makes sense from what you had talked about, Jason, where fossil fuels are ancient sunlight that has been stored, compacted, and transformed into this incredible, dense, easily trans, uh, um, Transport. transportable yeah. form. It has all these other benefits to it as well. You know, to think about getting sunlight that's falling even wind is a form of sunlight. Right. You know, that's 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 in the present in a sense. And we can talk about storing it, but that takes a lot of energy as well. Oh yeah. Well, even if you say let's say that your renewables have a pretty high energy return on energy invested, it still is problematic because of the way that those returns come back to you. Yeah. You know, if you get a a barrel of oil, you can burn it and use it for whatever you want. Whereas with uh, as you're talking about solar or wind, it's it's more of a flow over time. All of your energy that you invest is kind of up front, and then you have this slow payback yeah. period, say over 30 years for a solar panel, for example. And this so is a very important point. You cannot, again, it's, it's not that that's necessarily bad. Maybe that would be good in terms of slowing us down a little bit or making us think a little more carefully about how we use our energy. But it it certainly is bad if your intention is to maintain or even grow right. the kind of society that we've become accustomed to. Yeah, and there's some really interesting work being done on this. Uh, some some European biophysical kind of economist groups have modeled this sort of thing out, trying to understand how does the European industrial economy shift to building out renewable energy infrastructure. And so they looked at this and the materials required that you, that you that to put into building out the alternative energy infrastructure and the energy, of course, required to do that is so large and it only has a payback that delivers a slow payback that it basically sucks so much out of the rest of the economy that, that they don't, there's like, there's no way you can grow. Can't do both. The, you can't yeah. do both. Yeah. And yeah. so... This has been modeled. This has been understood not just from the perspective we've been talking about. Of like, you can tell these stories about you know hunting and having a quick, huge return and having all this surplus that you can do other things about, or having to really struggle to get enough every day. So what we're doing is when we talk about this renewable energy transition, it's putting in these technologies that don't provide this quick, high net payback, and it means that there isn't this surplus. To have what ballets and libraries and and super conducting super colliders, <laughs> and all this stuff we think about as like part of modernity. You go, can we support it anymore? That's the question. And we have another, which is uh, maybe a side topic, but a, another conundrum for ourselves, which is uh, that climate science tells us we have to rapidly right. phase out fossil fuels and decarbonize. I mean, to the point where the IPCC report a few years ago came out and said. Basically, within a dozen years, I was two years ago, 
we've got to reduce 45 percent yeah that's just massive right yeah most and people if, don't realize that that report was subtitled we're all gonna die <laughs> <laughs> um and and the the challenge there is that would say let's do the fastest build out of renewables we possibly can right when you do that, not only do you run into the issue that you're talking about, Jason, right. which is you're, you're, in a sense, cannibalizing energy from the rest of the economy. Right. And you're probably going to run up against some some constraints in terms of, of resources, you know, uh, natural resources that yeah. we need to get for the whole thing. And probably spurring investment Inflation. in all kinds of the worst shit, yeah. you know, more tar sands, more whatever. Yeah. You get a big pulse of carbon that comes out, even if you're able to do that. Right. You know, Um so it's a real, it's a real conundrum. But this gets, I think, back to this this whole thing around this being a hidden driver. The fact that we don't think about net energy means that we are not thinking about the choices that we're making in a realistic way. We think right? that we think technology is going to do it, and it's like you confuse the fact that these technologies are all based upon this continuous flow of this high net energy. That's right. I, this gets back even to energy literacy, where people don't even, I think, typically understand the difference between technology and energy. I, I've I mean, got, that, I got that's a, a huge point, Jason. I got to share a really depressing story with you on that front. <laughs> Yay! Depressing <laughs> stories. <laughs> So Gather around, I, I was in I was in DC. I didn't do a car trip, you know, with my parents. But I was in I was in Washington DC with David Hughes, who's somebody who PCI has worked with for a, a long time now, looking specifically at what's been happening with fracking, you know, mm-hmm. oil and, and gas production in the United States around that. And we went. We were there. We were doing some presentations and briefings. And while we were there, we decided to meet with. The Energy Information Administration, the IA. <laughs> now, I'm not going to go on a whole tirade, but the Energy Information Administration does an incredible job of providing us information. Yeah. They don't give us net energy information. Right. They give us gross energy information, but they have all this data that's incredible. They make it available to the public every year. They do this annual energy report, and which includes an outlook for the future. And they had been now for over a, a, a decade – been talking up the potential of uh, of fracking sources of of, of fossil fuels in the United States. And we were kind of pouring some cold water on that for lots of reasons I won't get into. This is like that, they they said California had this enormous amount at one point, I remember that. Yeah, so they had they had said that the Monterey formation in California had at the at the point that they published this this analysis, they they said something like two thirds of all of the unconventional resources, oil resources in the United States, um, property values plummet in Monterey, California. And no, what ended up <laughs> happening was you had these universities talking about how there's going to be such a surplus by producing this of tax revenue and all these things that it could pay for all this stuff, create all these jobs. Everyone was like all super excited about it. And, you know, the environmentalists were freaking out, understandably, because, like, this is the last thing that we should be doing right now from a climate perspective. And we are, like, the only ones out there saying, well, wait a second. Do we know that this is even real, like, that we can actually produce this much? Right. And and so we actually did publish a report with Dave, David Hughes basically saying there's no way that we could ever uh, achieve this, this, what they're claiming. You it's know, like hunting um, guinea pigs. And they, the EIA yeah, then down, <laughs> downgraded their, their projection by 96%, right, <laughs> afterwards. Right. But that's not the point of the story. The oh, story sorry. was here we were having a meeting with these guys, okay. and um, we were there with the guys that work on the energy, you know, energy outlook every year. And they had kind of hurt feelings because they felt like we were attacking them. And then we had the administer, administrator for the EIA, the top guy there, oh. okay, appointed by the government, uh, by the president of the United States. Who was there, and he was in a meeting with us, and we're having a conversation, and we brought up the topic of net energy, and he did not know what that was. Oh, he didn't know what that meant. Right. So we had to explain it to him, and we we're talking to him about well, look at tar sands, five right. to one, three to one ratio, and he still didn't understand the problem yeah. because he's he an economist. Hunting, did you talk to him about <laughs> hunting mastodons versus guinea pigs? Well, maybe we should have. Maybe he would have understood that, but. <laughs> no, he was an economist. He's like, okay, so we pay a little bit more money for it. Right. You know, he was only thinking about it from a financial perspective. Right. Did not understand that our society, like even just agrarian societies need yeah. 10 to 1, right. let's just say, in order to function, to have any of the things that they enjoy. Right. Okay. 
Imagine our society try to function on a three to one energy return on energy. Right. Look, investment. look, look. You don't want to go appointing somebody who understands physical reality to be the head of an agency. You want somebody who can, a can do person, a share who, who knows that with a little bit of money and, and, uh, you know, tons of analysts with a magic eight ball that the outlook is good. They know I, how to work spreadsheets. I got, there's two things here that just I can't I can't hit strongly enough in terms of their importance. One is all the things that we care about are a result of net energy. Like what? Art, education, you know, healthcare, science. advances in science. Sure. All the things that we enjoy about okay. life. All the things right? that we actually think is uh, human progress. Warm clothing. <laughs> <laughs> They're all. A result of surplus energy. What about love? Right? Is love, uh, I, I guess on some level it really is. You know, yeah, like if, if, you, if you can't live, you can't love. Right. Yeah, I know. So that's, that's one thing. And yeah. the second thing is nobody gets that. Nobody understands that. Nobody understands that there's an issue with this. If you think that the people that are at the highest levels of government and you know policy making and all this stuff get it, they don't get it either. Well, I get it now. Now that I know we've got all this surplus energy, I'm going to go eat 13 13- pounds of food and uh, get down to the gym so that I can deadlift, what, 38 pounds? (laughs) Because that is a perfect use of that net energy. Hey, buddy, it's lunchtime. I'm going to go cook it up for you. Yeah, sweet. Add a guinea pig if you would. Okay. Stay tuned for our George Costanza Memorial Do the Opposite segment where we discuss things we can do to get the hell out of crazy town. Now you don't have to just listen to the three of us blather on anymore. We've actually invited someone intelligent on the program to provide inspiration. Hey, Jason and share in an uh, ongoing uh, item here where we share a review, uh, we got a new one that just came in from BlackPoff05. Would you like to hear it? Of course I do. I'm up, make my day. Okay, here we go. Great podcast. I've listened eagerly to nearly every episode. I learned a ton from the overview of energy literacy in season one. A share, Jason and Rob, artfully blend humor and serious discussion of the most pressing challenges we face as a species. For someone who easily gets overwhelmed by reading and listening to content about the climate crisis, Crazy Town hits the spot. There. What do you think of that? Uh I just have to confess, that was my mom who wrote that review. No, I don't know. That's, Jason, that's are you Black Poff 05? <laughs> <laughs> not, not this time. I, I'm just distinctly uncomfortable with these kinds of compliments, but I do really appreciate it. I'm really happy they threw back to ep- season season uh, one. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for listening into the archives, of the deep archives of Crazy Town. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, please, if you like the show, go out and give us a rating and a review, and maybe we'll read yours. Every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. (laughs) My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. All right, do the opposite is uh, really tough for this one because you, you know, just like. Yeah, don't you, use energy at all. How about that? That's <laughs> Net energy is always bad. Well, I think <laughs> the big one that comes to my mind is the fact that we've essentially been substituting energy and mechanization for human labor. And that's been the big drive. That's what you are driven to do. Almost every business is like, Get rid of high labor intensity. Yeah, labor is our biggest cost. So yeah, we'll get rid of it. Drop it, plop it that. So, but almost every time we do that, if you look at the math, the amount of energy needed to do work goes up. So when we substitute technology, we say we're substituting technology for labor to reduce labor. We end up increasing the amount of energy needed to do the same tasks in almost every case. Yeah. So you can think of like the checkout stand at the supermarket. It's like, well, let's uh, let's put in computerized checkouts. Uh, so people can self-serve, and we're going to reduce labor, more energy. It's well, cheaper to, it's less energy to have a person standing there helping you check out. The only case I can think of counter to that is it's way less energy intensive to mine Bitcoin as a person. You know, you can dig up any <laughs> amount of Bitcoin, but the computer's running. Oh, yeah. yeah, super energy intensive. So to do the opposite is to say like, no, wait, 
stop, stop trying to replace labor with energy and technology. Actually, we need to shift to a, a high labor, low technology or lower technology economy. Well, yeah, good luck running on that as a platform. <laughs> well, it's also vote for it, Bradford. It's it's, re- it's really Join hard. Me more in the work. Salt, show me in the salt mines. <laughs> Less toys. It's really hard to do too when this is the system, right? Even yeah. if you're thinking about it as a business owner. Yeah. Every incentive is to minimize cost, which right now energy is still cheap. Right. Um, so it's almost more like find the right time to to do it. It's like be, prepare yourself mentally for a more labor intensive economy. Well, I know, like for me, I'm doing you know farming, and I I have all the I got, I got like student interns help out. I find ways to get people to volunteer. And they want the experience, right? They're interested in the educational aspect of it. And so, you know, there's there's ways maybe through training and education programs that sort of you you start building in systems that allow you to use more labor but still not go broke. Yeah. I, I still can't get over how politically implausible this do the opposite is. <laughs> I know. It's just so far from everything that we right. we tend to think of as a given as- assumption, right? right? Yeah. But yeah, it, but it's necessary. The other thing I think, just uh, sticking with the technology front, is do the opposite by by avoiding the whiz bang, super complex technology solutions that are being offered. You know, oh, the and, latest is hydrogen's back. Yeah. Right. Hydrogen paste, right? Um, right. The the Hindenburg people are all selling hydrogen left and right, huh? <laughs> it's just it's not just from a from a net energy standpoint. It's these complex technology systems yeah. are very vulnerable. And so thinking about more simple technology solutions, there's a there's a guy named Krista Decker who's got a, a website called Low Tech Magazine, basically. It's really remarkable. It is amazing. You know? And if you check the stuff out there, he, he talks a lot about a lot of technologies that are, you know, people call them appropriate technologies. They're smaller scale. They're less complex they meet a lot of human needs. We we were pretty ingenious 300 years ago too. It's yeah. not like we suddenly got super smart, you know. Right. Um, we just had less crazy energy to throw at things. So yeah. in and fact, ways so was there more ingenious then? And yeah. there's there's ways though, like we could if we were designing for this stuff, like designing for a low net energy future. I'm just imagining what we could do with 3D printing and advanced manufacturing to some extent, right? Like. There's probably amazing tools we could we could provide people that are super efficient compared to what they had uh, a couple hundred years ago, but instead we're not. Like you know, the other thing that got, drives me kind of nuts is the whole the whole fake meat business. Where you know, I understand industrial agriculture and industrial meat in particular is pretty horrific, but the fake meat is just a piggyback off of industrial agriculture and saying like grow corn and soy industrially though you get cheap inputs to then a factory to produce stuff that that approximates meat right. just absurd right another high tech ultra high processed uh foods food item well, right i think like a lot of the things that the three of us end up uh coming around to is that there's a balance here i liked what you said a share about technologies meeting human needs like there are needs that we have and there are ways of fulfilling those through technology, but it doesn't always have to be more and more and more technology. It's like we, we kind of need a win to stop rule on it. And that book that you referenced by Eric Brende. Better off. Yeah. That is a great, it's an, it's, 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 you know, over 10 years old now, but what a great book that was. Yeah. It really it really just you know talks about that from an amazing perspective of technology and culture and how to choose a technology that's appropriate. Yeah, I think that for me a do the opposite is really trying to get yourself in that mindset. You know, we're not really experiencing the net energy decline in a really serious way yet. Uh, we may experience it soon, you know, whatever. I I, I don't know that I could predict with any kind of accuracy when we might really feel those effects. But if you can kind of wrap your head around the idea that I can live a more powered down life and uh, maybe I'm even happier, you know, that I'm finding ways to meet my needs simply. I mean, I I think that's a lot of what the voluntary simplicity movement is about. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those folks are 
happy and lead meaningful lives. Yeah. Figure out how to get lean. Uh, figure out how to use lower, less complex tech that you can understand and maybe fix yourself, maybe have someone locally actually make perhaps, and just demand less energy in general. It seems like a lot of work. I, I think we should just go crazy for a while, eat as many calories as we possibly can, consume as much energy as we possibly can. Figure out how to get lean like half Thor Bjornsson. We should, we should cook exactly the meal or the daily meals that you mentioned and just see if the three of us can eat that. Yeah, let's, let's go get some food. <laughs> Okay, Crazy Towners, get ready. I'm uh, thrilled to have the chance to interview Alice Friedemann, a friend of mine for about 15 years now. Alice is one of these rare, prolific, generalist-type people. She's an avid reader of nonfiction books and the peer-reviewed literature and can pull together this comprehensive perspective on so many subjects by being literate and familiar with so many sources. She's ecologically and energy literate and the author of a few books we will mention in the interview, most recently Life After Fossil Fuels, and the creator of the website energyskeptic.com. All righty, here we go. Alice, thank you so much for joining us on Crazy Town for the Do the Opposite interview on our Net Energy show. So welcome. Thank you. Good to see you, Jason. Yeah, good to see you. I gave you kind of the raw recording of the show, so you had a chance to kind of review this show on net energy and follow the conversation that Rob and Asher and I had. So I just wanted to know, before we get going into the kind of the do the opposite side of things, if you had any additional insights on the importance of net energy and how it has landed us in crazy town. Well, my favorite part of the show was talking about um, Thor. Half Thor, yeah. Half Thor, because in my Life After Fossil Fuels, I stumbled on a Department of Energy website that's desperately trying to explain to the public how energy works, and they use the burrito unit of measurement. So if a burrito is like 1,200 calories a burrito, then we need 600 burritos of energy to stay alive. And they also worked out how much you use in your driving around and your heating of your home you're actually consuming 31,000 burritos a year. Okay, so the 600 is a year, and then... is for just food, your food calories. Your food, right. And then all the other stuff is 31,000. Yeah, and then the world's using like 41 septillion. There's so many <laughs> zeros <laughs> that I, I'm not even sure what the number is. Yeah, so we, we didn't do the conversion of like the half Thor burrito diet, but yeah, um, similar kind of concept. So that's great. Yeah, that's a really neat example. Yeah, it was fun to read your book. I got into I got into quite a bit of it. And anything else? Like I remember the, there was a lot of interesting stuff, for example, in Chapter 9 that I don't think we covered very well. Do you want to go over some of that? Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the electricity for trying to build electric trucks, which my first book, I explained why that won't happen. Batteries are too heavy, basically. But there hasn't been much done about electrifying manufacturing. So mm-hmm. how are you going to make wind turbines and so on if, if you can't manufacture them with electricity? It turns out that manufacturing is so competitive, you know, pennies of profit, that it, nobody's ever even looked at electrifying manufacturing because huh. it would cost trillions to convert existing factories, and they would just relocate to wherever there were still fossil fuels. So just economically, it's not going to happen. Some scientists have started to look into it, and there still is no electric way to make cement. Right. And it has to do with these hundreds of feet long kilns, kilns. and direct yeah. and in- indirect heat. Steel can be recycled electrically, but fresh steel, you, you need incredibly high heat, and that's true for all metals, uh, up to 3,200 Fahrenheit. And that requires fossil fuel heat. Renewables can't do it. Geothermal only generates 380 degrees. Nuclear, about 600. Solar parabolic troughs, 750. Um, Even advanced nuclear, 
would only be 1500 So it's only half of what you need for a lot of products. Yeah. Glass, ceramics, bricks, microchips. So much of our world is built on that high heat of fossil fuels. Yeah, it's fascinating. Your book has this really interesting charts that talk about these products that we're used to getting, right? The steel, the cement, sand to make glass, you know, silicon. And that we used to use wood and we make charcoal out of the wood, but coal replaced that. But that was how we sort of were able to start doing some of this stuff was with charcoal and learning a bit with early industrial revolution, right? Yeah. So I find it really fascinating that no one's really talking about it, like you said, that getting high heat in manufacturing was a critical part of early industrial revolution. And electricity is just a very, very inefficient and difficult way to get heat that high. And no one's really studied it, like you're saying. I just, it's just amazing what we're talking about this transition to an all electric economy, right? <laughs> That's the thing. And you go, wait a second, these, all these, in, these industrial manufacturing plants, which are enormous, complex places, how do, we, how do we transition any of them? It's just like a complete, just nobody seems to be talking or thinking about it, like, except for like you. What's the deal? <laughs> I don't know. So, so, you know, you raise some hopes with wood charcoal, but that doesn't scale up. You lose your, all your forests within a month right. or two. Who knows? I haven't worked that out exactly. But coal makes much better products than wood charcoal, much yeah. sturdier, stronger, better quality. And we've peaked in coal production in the United States decades ago, worldwide probably too. Mm -hmm. um, oil production peaked in 2018. Yeah. So even the fossil energy isn't going to be around much longer. Right. And that's why it's called, you know, life after fossil fuels. So I think, you know, you, you do a really good job of sort of understanding why it's difficult to just continue to manufacture wind turbines, solar panels, etc. without fossil fuels. Like once you, you know, we can maybe build a whole fleet of them with fossil fuels because we can manufacture things. So they're made out of concrete and they're made out of steel and complex plastics, for example, and sand. And those are just require this high temperature that they can't themselves regenerate very well. So it's not only that, but renewables are intermittent. There's right. many products that run 24 hours, seven days a week. Oh, and these if you factories, were to interrupt right. Right. These factories, if you interrupted the process, then the pipes would clog up with the chemical or whatever was being made. Right. And ru ruin the factory for, for weeks or months until you could get the stuff out of the piping. Right. So we don't know how to do it, batch it, processing of a lot of stuff. It's all this continuous processing. Microchips can take four months to make. If at any moment the electricity goes out, you've just lost four months of microchips that are in every product. Even your toaster has a microchip. One more thing. You can't store the high heat. It dissipates very quickly, and it won't store at any hot temperature. Right. So it, that, that's not an option. Like, we're trying to store electricity and batteries. That That's almost impossible, but storing heat's even more impossible. And hydrogen right. won't work. Uh, all these other possibilities aren't going to make manufacturing possible either. Yeah, and we do talk about that kind of in crazy town, you know, the energy literacy issue and the fact that we're, we just don't quite understand energy and these unique properties of fossil fuels and the trade-offs of different energy systems. So I think your book does a good job of that. And, and what I found fascinating then was you have this frame, this really key frame in your book of wood world versus fossil world. And there are so many insights into this. And what it means, basically, your conclusion is we're going to go back to wood world. That so civilization, if it lasts, will be a, a wood world civilization. And so maybe share some of the key points um, in your book related to what, what wood world means and what it means in the context of do the opposite. Well, obviously, we should be reforesting and especially building coppiced woodlands that people mm. can harvest to cook their food with, to heat their homes, to build furniture. Wood becomes our new infrastructure too, not just heat source. Basically what all civilizations did before fossil fuels. And that gets rid of CO2. Like It's a real happy uh, thing <laughs> to do. The, the decline of energy is, is joined at the hip with 
climate change and yeah. what you need to do for reduced energy also will help with climate change. Yeah. And so if we have to heat with wood again, it seems like then we've got to rethink how we live, right? Yeah, you want us much smaller square feet to heat and deal with, insulated. Townhouses or homes uh, built up against each other to share the heat. Yeah, and people talk about why cities are then so much more efficient, right? So there's this often this thing in sort of the sustainability literature of pack people in the cities because there's, efi- there's efficiency there, and they're often referring to this kind of efficiency. But then the dilemma becomes these cities are so vast and, re- and have such a f- high area footprint that now people can't provision from any from locally. So are we talking more than like historic villages where you would have clusters of people and then but they could walk to walk to their forests and fields? Oh, exactly. I mean, in previous wood civilizations, 80% of people were farmers. So we definitely need to be going back to that and and organic agriculture because another important use of fossil fuels is the natural gas fertilizer, which is not only a component, but the energy to make it, keeps half of the world's population alive, 4 billion people. The only replacement for natural gas fertilizer is composting, organic agriculture, which also gives the soil the health to protect plants from pests. And since we're running out of pesticides, well, then you're solving that problem too. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, <clears throat> I do think that theoretically that organic agriculture done with um, these good complex rotations, with good soil health, can prevent a lot of the problems that these pesticides and these fertilizers are are there to solve. It's almost like we created the problems with all this industrial monocropping that required these high-tech then chemical solutions, but we don't necessarily need them. But it does mean a lot more labor then is back back into managing then the more complex, smaller scale crop rotations, et cetera. Well, that solves the obesity crisis. We'll all be <laughs> so, much, so much healthier. And, you got to um, eat more burritos. People... <laughs> oh, you do? Oh, I love burritos. I could do it. <laughs> but a, a lot of people say, well, organic agriculture can't grow as much food. But in my book, I cite a meta study of over 5,000 comparisons of organic to industrial agriculture And in only a little over 10% of these studies across different types of food and climates did industrial agriculture produce more than organic. So this is doable. Yeah. And I think what's interesting, it's doable also, and we really haven't put our minds to it. So I'm always kind of curious on what if... What if, what if, you know, the, the university system, the businesses and all the talents they have, what if they turned their attention towards solving the, some of the engineering and, you know, challenges for the wood world? I'm, I worry, for example, about all the, all the tools that would need to be ramped up and at a different scale for smaller, smaller farms. I worry about insulation of homes in manufacturing homes with local renewable materials uh, designing for these things. I, uh, I worry about just the manufacturing that does need to still happen and how it needs to be decentralized and the storage and decentralization of like grain storage. I used to have, apparently I talked to this, my neighbor, Francis is a hundred years old and I visit her once in a while. <laughs> and th- apparently right across where I live now near my house was a granary. Like, I don't know, 60 years ago, there was still a little granary here. Just amazing, like what we've lost, right? How do we get that back? And, and what kind of, what kind of a talent would be, it would be great to turn towards that again, right? Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite solutions would be to build more living history sites across the country and get young kids like an AmeriCorps program to mm-hmm. relearn these skills. It would, it would make the transition a lot easier. Yeah. You know, to to have that in mind, ironsmithing, the whole blacksmithing, the whole what we used to know in the past, uh, bring it back. And it could almost be self-supporting. You know, you could have um, bed and breakfast and food to table. Um, I would I would want to do it. I mean, I yeah, think it would be fun. I'm always kind of fascinated on the idea of, yes, there's the historical way of doing things. But then also, you know, are there things that we that we've learned that we can take forward. 
uh, that might be better. Like some of the tools that we have today are probably, we could engineer better versions of the stuff from the 1860s, let's say. I, that would be also really interesting, I'm thinking. Oh, there's so much we could do. We could build more canals because water transport is hundreds of times more energy efficient than land transport. People yeah. used to only live near navigable rivers, lakes, and oceans in the past. They didn't live inland because right. it was you know, crazy expensive. We could build Roman roads again. You know, huh. The roads now have so much rebar in them that rusts and expands that roads only last 20 years. And they're made of asphalt, which comes from petroleum. So build these, they built thick stone roads that still exist 2,000 years later. The Incan um, roads exist too, also. The Incan. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Kind of a parallel sort of road building infrastructure that's still around. That's amazing, right. You know, so much of what we've talked about, it needs to happen at the whole society level. And of course, folks like you and I... Um, get pretty frustrated because we can't do that. We're not going to organize a, 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 a new canal. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, what can people like you and I do besides just speaking up and trying to like plan and, and consider and theorize, hoping others will someday get on board as, as fossil fuels wane in the meantime? What can we do in the meantime to get ready for Wood World? Well, I... I... I've always thought victory gardens were a good idea in World War II. They're still a good idea. And plant fruit trees. Some of the local communities out here have food forests for the poor. They're planting fruit trees on public ways that you can harvest from. And a lot of the um, kales and chards are decorative. So yeah. they're, plant, they're planting those instead of uh, shrubbery. Uh, the community level is where you can actually make things happen. Mm -hmm. I, I think the yeah. higher levels are more difficult. Sure. Yeah. Lots of, lots of useful skills to learn. Um, what about things we haven't covered? I think, you know, there are risks in this transition from the fossil to the wood world that need to be considered. What are the, some of the ones that, that you really keeps you up at night sometimes? Well, what we learned from Fukushima is that it's not so much the reactor that's that's dangerous. It's the spent nuclear fuel pools where they cooled down the older cylinders yeah, that were rods. making the reactor happen. And they're not protected. They're not under a shelter. Uh, up to 8 million people might have to be evacuated in Philadelphia if one of the electricity failed and these uh, devices couldn't be kept cool. Um, right. And then in the long term, we have to get rid of the nuclear wastes in general on top of that be because future generations aren't going to be able to pick and shovel their way and bury it deep enough. I mean, that, right. that if we're going to, we're leaving the future generations such, you know, such a crummy world, that's the least we could do for them. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm real passionate about that because yeah. the wastes can last hundreds of thousands of years. My other big thing, since I love reading books, is the electric grid's going to go down. I write a lot about that in both my books. And so we need to preserve knowledge. And, uh, you know, I prefer something more permanent than books. But mm. since we're not planning, that's probably the best way to do it. You know, try to get things printed that you'd like to pass on to your children. On good acid-free paper kind of thing, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think mo most uh, paper now is acid-free. But, that, okay. yeah. 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 Okay, great. There's a lot on your website about that. Um, we'll we'll give we'll give a shout out to your to your websites at the end. So yeah, there's a lot to take in. Of course, I wonder if you wanted to share. I, chapter thirty three was interesting to me. You kind of went into some of the upsides of the of the situation we're in. The upsides of life after fossil fuels. Why don't we Why don't we discuss those a bit? Well, oil is naturally declining at eight and a half percent a year which is offset by 4% of enhanced oil production and new projects coming online. But it's still declining at 4% a year. Well, hello, I don't know how many hundreds of millions of solar panels and wind turbines would be the equivalent, but I can't imagine a better fix for climate change than oil decline. Yeah. Because oil makes everything else possible, including coal and natural gas, steel, everything around you transportation above all. And so the scientists that have looked at realistic fossil reserves 
think that the climate will warm up at you know somewhere between the 2.6 and 4.5 scenarios. That's not a degree Fahrenheit. We're talking about the RCP pathways. This is the IPCC models that look at how much fossil fuels will be burned, how much CO2 emissions there will be, for example. So when you say RCP, that's like a, a resource emissions pathway. And the 2.6, I believe now then refers to the watts per meter squared addition. I just want to make sure people understand what we meant by 2.6 or 4.5. And, and the, I mean, I'm not saying I don't believe in climate change. I mean, quite the contrary. It's going to be around for hundreds of years, but it will gradually decline as the oceans and land absorb it. And our new forests that we're building for the future wood world will, will help quite a bit, too. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. I, I think Post Carbon Institute has done some work also in kind of contrasting the IPCC models with more realistic scenarios for fossil fuel availability. So yeah, people can argue about how fast oil will decline, how quickly people will will um, adjust in- investment to try to like ramp them back up, you know, if they start to decline too fast. But what's interesting is you're seeing all this discussion in the International Energy Agency also now talking about, okay, let's stop investing in fossil fuel reserves and exploration. And I'm kind of, I've got two minds of this, right, Alice? Part of me is going, oh, great, you know, we're not going to, we're not going to keep exploring and keep investing in these because we've got to wean ourselves off them. And then part of me is just like, but oh, no, they have no idea what the consequences are. There is still this fantasy outlook uh, within the energy agencies that, these renewables will then somehow substitute. So what you know what's going to happen? I imagine something like, sure, maybe banks and governments get shamed into not doing fossil fuel development. We have a very fast decline, like you're saying, of oil and coal. The economy ends up just absolutely tanking, maybe five, ten years out as a result. And then we kind of struggle to figure out what to do, right? I don't know if you've thought about this much, but uh, the future scenarios of of the geopolitics and finance of all this is just really bizarre to contemplate. I just hope there's rationing plans. Uh, We've been through this before. In the 70s, we thought we were running out of oil. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the Department of Energy had a rationing plan. And in it, whatever agriculture needed got off the top. Yeah before any more oil was distributed to other essential services. And way at the bottom were the citizens, you know. Yeah. Uh, and they could only get gasoline if it was available every other day. It was, a, you know, yeah. hundreds of pages long. Stan Cox, in any way you slice it, has come up with even better, more sophisticated plans. And we ought to have those already in place. Yeah. Oh, it's funny because uh, Nate, Nate Hagens brought up Stan Cox when I interviewed him recently. And we did cover them, I think, in, in season two. We, we reviewed that book. So yes, rationing. It's actually our least popular episode, if you look at the number of downloads. <laughs> but I'm like, why? We need to ration this stuff. It's super important, people. Go back and listen to the rationing episode. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm old-fashioned, but I loved college. Before the internet, I didn't have a car. It was very social. Uh, we all cooked for each other every night. I, I mean, I'm almost looking forward to going back, hmm. you know, picking up my cello again. Yeah. Um, it just, the, I, this, this world seems really strange to me. I never understood nuclear families. It's not natural. Right. I'm, I'm ready for the village life. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, you are prolific at at writing about this stuff and you've read so much. I think you only read nonfiction or something. Is that right? She's nodding. Yes. You know, my parents were so nuts that like really early on, I was like reading encyclopedias and trying to figure out what was going on, you know, what was reality. And then I, I find most nonfiction is written, you know, especially biographies are, can be more interesting than, than a fiction book, but mm-hmm. yeah. Cool. So, um, Let's leave people with how they can follow your work. You have a, you have a couple websites. Energyskeptic.com is one. And then you've got one called wholegrainalice.com. So you, you actually are into crackers and these sort of recipe things. So 
energyskeptic.com and wholegrainalice.com. Anything else you want to throw out there or where to follow you? You got two books out. I think that'll do it. Okay. Life After Fossil Fuels and uh, by Springer, right, uh, as a publisher. And then When the Trucks Stop Running was the a previous book, as well as your cookbook uh, on, on the crackers, right? Yeah. And the okay. crackers ties back in with uh, the whole energy crisis because you can make crackers that'll last a year. Yeah. And um, cheaply, if you make your own, it can be like, you know, a quarter versus $6 for the same thing at the store. They're delicious. I've tried them. I've got your book, The Crackers. And you can make it out of any flour, too, like lentil, bean, yeah. nut. Um, it doesn't have to be wheat by any means. Well, excellent. Alice, thank you so much for your work and joining us here on the Do the Opposite segment of Crazy Town. <laughs> thank you, Jason. You too. That's our show. Thanks for joining us in Crazy Town. This is a program of Post Carbon Institute. Get more info at postcarbon.org. Okay, guys. Uh, you know, the net energy of, of farming is, is kind of marginal, right? You have to invest a lot. You, you, you have to plant, you know, prepare the soil, weed, water, harvest. There's a lot going on. And I think in many ways... It's easier to hunt, right? If you've got a lot of biomass just kind of walking around and you can go get it, it's low hanging fruit, so to speak, <laughs> but savory. <right? laughs> savory. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and in today's world, the, mo- the most common animals around are, let's face it, people. Yes. I didn't want to say it. Yeah. So today's sponsor. I don't, I don't like today's sponsor so far. <laughs> well, they have an app because. You know, you don't want to have to run people down. <laughs> I mean, it's to, a lot of work. Right? This of is work. all about saving energy, right? Yeah. You want to just sort of sit on your... You want to just be able to couch surf and just draw them in. Right. Okay. And what are people addicted to? Uh, games or phones. They're always looking at their phones doing shit, right? Right. Okay. So, you guys have heard of Pokemon. Yeah. Okay. Pokemon Go, yeah. Pokemon Go. So, the, today's sponsor has a, has a hack. It's a, it's, a, it's a design where you basically... Your app will... will will send out a lure. Like a Pokemon character. Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. And it's called Pokemon Hunter is the app. And it's uh-huh. brilliant. Very high value characters show up in right in front of your home and they draw the people into your lair. <laughs> so um, really, is that the prey comes to you. Right. So yeah. you can just sit on your ass. You can just sit on your ass. The net energy on that's got to be tremendous. They just walk right up. So anyway... Please, Huge. please do not go out and get Pokemon Hunter people. Okay, just don't. It's don't a very do it. expensive app. Shut up, Rob. <laughs> but, Thanks for this. But it's worth it. Crazy town. Da, 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 da. Crazy town.